like I said, week three already. So that means lecture three. Usual approach, please do check your phone if it's in silent mode. And then uh, we can continue with the risk assessment course today. Risk identification. The menu. I give you a short look back, a recapitulation of security, risks, and then I start <coughs> with the overview of risk identification and then we dig deep down into the various steps for risk identification. Of course I'll end up with the summary and the <coughs> Not so nice topic, uh, of course, uh, your homework. Recap on security. Why bother? Well, we're not talking about information security only, we are also talking about uh, security in general, because information security is a part of at this moment a lot of organizations uh, you can uh, remember um, shit happens so security incidents uh, will come forward always at a moment that you uh, don't want it to uprise always at a moment that it's not convenient always at a moment that you didn't expect it to happen but it happens. The only thing you can do with uh, security incidents is try to anticipate. Um, because you have a risk that the security incident will cause major loss to your uh, organization. So what can we do? First know what the risks are and if we have made an inventorization of all the risks we can define measures. That's nice, but uh, part of the measures are human. Human, the so-called no-tech measures, are human uh, measures. They are our front line of defense against risk, but humans are also the weakest link in our security measures. So we have to think about how we going to react on incidents using humans. We'll take a deeper look into uh, the human aspect when we are talking about countermeasures in the lessons that will follow this lesson, this lecture. What do we want? We want a situation where everybody in an organization has the feeling, yes, we have to do something about it. And the first thing to do to deal with risk is to become aware of um, the effects, the negative effects that come from actual risks or actual incidents. How do we get there? Well, you know, there are three ways. Enforcing, establishing and educating. Um, we can best start one on, on the one hand by enforcing and in establishing an ISMS and on the other hand trying to uh, educate all the people in your organization by raising awareness. How do we do that? Well, you have seen it, to confront the organization to tell a story and to investigate. Well, and after that, uh, uh, don't think you are there because it should be on a regular basis that you keep your organization and therefore your uh, people ready. The three ways. Well, I said we take two tracks, the formal track through establishing and enforcing, and the informal track, awareness raising. The best way to raise awareness were these three. Confrontation 
will be the result of the uh, risk assessment that we are going to perform. If you know what the results are from your risk assessments, you can show an organization this is the way it's going now and this is the way it could be. So make your choice. Decide what to do. We only give advice. But it's the management that has to be confronted and has to decide which way are we going to use to treat the risks that became obvious after our risk assessment. The second part, storytelling, well, you tell the story. You had an assignment to tell a story. I'll come up to that in a moment. Investigating, well, we are not going to investigate really um, a security incident. That is a, a, a part we are doing in the next course when we are talking about incident response. Then we have to investigate what the incident exactly was, how it happened, who was involved, and so on and so on. So now we are only concentrating on confrontation and storytelling. You had the first assignment to tell a story to raise info security or security awareness. You had the possibility uh, to go through a lot of pictures, make your uh, uh, selection uh, based on a story you had in mind. Um, you should outline your story and the appropriate pictures you use to visualize your story. And you ha should hand it, uh, have handed in a, a PowerPoint. Well, I found uh, uh, nearly from all pairs uh, PowerPoints in the Dropbox. Um, after last Thursday, I looked in the different assignment folders and yes, I came across a couple of extra presentations, so they will be accepted and graded as well. There was a question earlier. Do we get uh, our results on the assignments, yes, you get. What I did was look into all the stories you delivered and I took out the top three. The first place is a, a, a shared one. Two presentations delivered were the best. The second place was achieved by one presentation and there were even three presentations that were equal and got the third place. I can say that all the assignments uh, uh, for uh, um, the results for the practical assignment one are positive so nobody has to rework on whatever it's okay. Okay means uh, you got at least a 5.5 so everybody managed to survive assignment one. What I will do, I will show you the results of the top three because they illustrate quite nice what you have done. Well, this one is uh, from uh, Bart and Leo, present. I, I simply show you the presentation. Which place is it? Which place is it? Is it the third one or the first one? Third one. I start with, uh, the, uh, with rank three. <laughs> yes, yes. There is a story in it, a clear beginning, the piece in the middle and a, a, a nice closing.
The second presentation that comes in rank three from Abdel and Tom. They used at least all the feedback they got during the tutoring. The second or the third uh, on uh, rank three from Eddie and Hamza. One presentation in rank two, Danish and Mark. You, you have to look closely because there are some small hidden figures. Then, this is the um, only presentation with text, and that's because uh, uh, Maike, I, I haven't seen her today yet, is only attending the lectures on Monday, and we made it clear during the tutoring that no text was allowed. Whenever uh, I, I saw uh, this uh, presentation and because um, the setting is awfully good, uh, the fonts are very appropriate for the time uh, frame where the story. So I thought I have to show you this, although it has text.
Come on. I have to quit soon. There's a bug in this presentation. Okay. I'll try another way. This way. Yeah, the ma you can applaud, of course. This was uh, the, the 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 best one was fully uh, animated, so it, it, those guys did a great uh, job. And they will receive an appropriate uh, grade. What what I noticed in your. Uh, um, 
results are on assignment one that there were a lot of dragons, a lot of gold. Not uh, all the pictures were used. Uh, there are modern uh, interpretations, uh, ancient uh, results, and well, I enjoyed much uh, looking into your uh, results of your uh, as a first assignment. I hope this, it will be the same with assignment two, uh, but uh, I have to check after this uh, lecture tonight if uh, everybody managed and I will come back on that on Thursday. <laughs> A short uh, recapitulation uh, about uh, risks. <coughs> we know we have to care. Why? The mission is the most important. That is what we want to achieve. Therefore, we buy or acquire uh, assets. We need those assets to fulfill our uh, mission. And assets can be uh, from miscellaneous that will not cost very much, like paper clips, or uh, assets that are very critical. We can't afford us to lose a critical asset because uh, otherwise we can't manage to achieve our mission. And it could be even more worse. Um, uh, we could stop existing as an organization. So, we have four questions to answer. We know now what uh, uh, risk is about. It's about uh, insecurity of our assets. So, to make it more sure, we have to protect it. What assets? Well, at least the critical ones. And maybe some extra that are a little bit less critical. We are not dealing with the miscellaneous uh, parts, the paper clips and uh, 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 the copying uh, uh, paper or whatever. So we focus on the critical assets and there are a lot of threat events that can be um, present coming from either threat agents, persons or organizations or coming from natural causes. These threat events use something that is there when we look at the assets that are vulnerabilities, weak spots, and threat agents and natural uh, causes most of the time use this vulnerability, uh, this weakness to create a security incident. So what, do you, what we need to do is first, where do we stand now, what's good, what's not good, and then decide what the appropriate measures are to protect our assets, to remove where possible vulnerabilities so that we can cope with threat events. That's not an easy thing, it's easy to say, but it's not easy to implement it. So we can take several steps the formal way, we start at uh, uh, the management level and we implement uh, uh, quite a lot of formal steps, uh, positioning, uh, looking at the culture, uh, implementing governance, risk princip principles should be defined and finally we need a, a, a management system. And while implementing a management system, we also have to perform a risk assessment. Well, we, we made ourselves easy. We take the ISO 27001 as an ISMS, an information security management system. We combine it with the uh, ISO uh, 27002. There the measures I defined. And the measures from section 5 until section 15 will help us to, well, plaster the vulnerabilities. But first we have to deal with section 4 to do risk management. And that was a problem because there was a missing link. We decided to use ISO uh, 31000, the risk management model, with a beautiful 
risk management process with the normal management cycle, the PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. And according to uh, this model, the do part is our part. In the do part, first we have to establish the context. We have to look at our organization that is going to be assessed. What is the link from our organization to its environment, the external context? And then we have to look into our organization to establish the internal context. After that, then we can start our risk assessment. It's a threefold process, starting with risk identification, then going through risk analysis, and finally up to risk evaluation. And we end our do part with the risk treatment. We are going to define what the best way is according the risk assessment to deal with the found risks. When you take this apart and you said it, put it into a model, then you see first we do that, then we do that, and finally we do that. This is the total process we are going to undergo and to perform. Brings me to the risk identification. What are we going to do? Our fundamental approach in uh, risk identification, we combine the A, B and C process out of our risk management uh, uh, model and we combine it with the seven elements of the risk model. So this is our fundamental process, A, B, C. This is our fundamental risk model with the grey components, the owners, the threat agents and the assets as a starting point and then we work our way into the middle of this model. These seven elements. We start today with owners, assets and threat agents, a, a bit about the, the uh, threats and in the next lecture after the uh, holidays we go the blue way up until we uh, manage to define our countermeasures. Your last assignment that you uh, uploaded today in the Dropbox, that was the last time that it can be uploaded to the Dropbox. Next time I will show you at the end at homework where you have to upload uh, your next assignment. So I will, uh, when I look into it, then I find uh, uh, how you established both the external and the internal context of Silver Star Mines, our model organization. Now the context is clear. We can start with B, the risk assessment, and our first part is B1, risk identification. That's where I have to swap to the other document. Okay. What do we have now? Doing the complete due part of the risk management process, we started with A, establishing the context, A1 external, A2 internal, we now have two results, A1 an overview of the external context and A2 an overview of the internal context. Now we can go one level deeper. We are now going to look into the assets, the threat agents and the threats. I simply stated uh, uh, the most important thing you have to do, but it will be subdivided into a lot of steps. We start with the assets. Understand and describe the organization's assets. I'll talk you through <coughs> the process with a general example, and then you have to do 
an assignment to use this general example on the case of silver star mines. So, the assets. Understand and describe the organization's assets, then the threat agents. Understand and describe what threat agents there are against the organization's assets. And finally, 1.3, the threats. Understand and describe what threats there are against the org. So it's always understand and describe. We are not analyzing yet. It's only identify assets, identify threat agents, identify threats. The next big B step is the B2, the risk analysis. Then we are going to combine all the results that comes from B1, the risk identification. Okay. Today we'll cover performing asset characterization. We need two extra steps, but I won't talk you through it today. That's in our next, our fourth lecture, then we are going to look into the consequences and the vulnerability of assets. So today it's only perform an asset characterization. Asset characterization is uh, uh, the first step in B1, because it's about assets and it's the first step, it's B11. We start with the asset in identification. What you have to do in a risk assessment is simply make a list of all the assets in an organization. Well, you are not going to note or write down until the paper clips. So try to concentrate on the major assets. First you make this list and when you have listed the assets, you are trying to group the assets or what is called, you are going to categorize the assets into classes. We have four classes, people, property, information and reputation. You see the picture uh, on the right hand side of uh, the slide. Every part of this uh, circle is one class, one asset class. When you have finished your asset identification, your result will be an, an asset list. That's a spreadsheet, that's the best way to do it, because you can manipulate with uh, uh, the spreadsheet later on when we do a uh, 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 risk analysis. An asset list is a spreadsheet that lists the organization's major assets in an organized fashion. So we are going to group the assets per class. What do you have to put from your asset list onto your uh, specific class? Well, there are some general examples here on the slide. If you talk about class 1, the people class, uh, you can have uh, your employees in it, you can have your customers in it, your vendors, your patients, your guests, your passengers, your tenants, your, uh, maybe you have contract employees. Um, every other person or group of persons that um, can be present in your organization lawfully. So the owner has granted permission to be in that organization. That's class one, people. And it depends on the organization. Maybe you have specific uh, groups. Um, Silver Star Mines, for example, won't have uh, uh, patients, won't have passengers. But if you're talking about uh, 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 an airline company or something like that, then you have passengers. If you're talking about uh, a hospital as an organization, then you talk about uh, patients. Maybe you have nurses, you have surgeons, so it depends on the organization what kind of uh, groups of people you have in your class one. When you talk about class two, property, you should consider that uh, everything an organization owns 
when it comes to real estate, the buildings, uh, the facility, the land, um, the um, things you can touch, we call it the tan tangible asset, um, cash, real money, um, metals, stones, instruments, equipment, or whatever, that is all property. And the person who is mentioned as owner is often not only the owner but also the caretaker of this property. Unless you rent it, your building, then you are not the owner but you are the, <coughs> at least the caretaker. The third class is uh, information. Not every piece of information in an organization, but it comes down to proprietary data. Data you need to be uh, careful with. Examples you see, trade secret, marketing plans, business expansion plans, plant closings, confidential personal information about employees, customer lists, whatever. Everything you don't want your uh, competitor in the outside world get hold on. Reputation is the fourth class. That's the goodwill. You have, as an organization, to gain a certain amount of trust or confidence with your vendors or with your suppliers, with your customers, uh, whatever. And it's, it's intangible, you, you can't touch it, but it's very, um, well, easy to lose. If you are uh, an airline company and you had uh, uh, one or more uh, air crashes, then the confidence of the people who want to travel with your airplanes goes down. And finally, your whole company could go down. So, you have your asset list and then you are trying to categorize all the assets. I will show you how this, this, this looks like. First you stated all the assets, that's your asset list, then you make a new spreadsheet and then you say, well, uh, uh, one people, for example, every organization will have those categories, senior executive management, employees, contractors, vendors, customers, visitors. And depending on your organization. So for Silver Star Mines, it could be that there are extra uh, entries in class one people. are the kinds of information about class 2 property, real estate, vehicles, fixtures, furnishings, equipment, IT equipment, very important supplies, cash flow, bank accounts, and it depends on the organization what is extra word listing. The same with information. Unique business processes. It could be that you have your business processes so, so uh, um, uh, remarkably established that if your competitor knows how you do your business process, he can get a lot of advantage out of it. So some organizations are very secretive about how they do their business, what business processes there are. And there is a reason behind it. If, if, if you think about uh, the police or military, uh, they don't want to go too much into detail. Because it's highly confidential if you know how their unique business processes are. And if you are in a competitive market, then you, want, you don't want to share exactly how you do your business processes from A to Z. Your vital records, well, you have to keep them because if you lose them, then you get fined or even worse. If you have secret formulas and patents, then it's, uh, hmm, the competitor is uh, always uh, looking for something that he or she might copy 
to earn extra money without doing big investments. Your security system is also uh, a proprietary uh, information because you don't want the outside world to know exactly how you secured uh, your organization. What IT system you exactly have in your organization is something you want to be uh, careful with. Uh, of course, everybody knows uh, you should have a, a network and you should have connections uh, over the internet, but what you exactly have, so some organizations won't even tell what uh, brand they have in the house. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, how do you, do you have to write this down? Because it says IT system now, you should just put in IT system or Okay. Here we have the IT equipment, you can say the hardware. And here it's the IC st IT system, you can say that's the software. So you don't make it smaller, so you don't separate it in like email system or whatever? Yes, you can subdivide it. Oh, okay. okay th this is only a, a, a general uh, category. If you want to, s to s uh, make um, uh, differences between the IT systems you have, you will say in general IT system and then you can subdivide in an uh, email uh, system, uh, a SCADA system or whatever. Yes? This is more a general uh, uh, label uh, to put on it. it. It's exactly like your telecommunications uh, system. Yeah, you can have a telecommunication system for telephony, but you can also have it for uh, your data communication. Your paper records, don't forget uh, uh, the analog world, there are a lot of pieces of paper that belong to proprietary information that you are, uh, have to keep, for example, uh, contracts where signatures uh, are on and you have to keep those uh, paper records uh, that can be um, uh, uh, specifically uh, contracts, but it can also be forms or notes about um, strategic meetings, whatever. Your customer lists belong to proprietary information. Nobody uh, uh, wants to lose the list of customers because your, comp uh, your competitor is uh, looking for it. Then he can earn a new piece of the market without great effort if he simply uh, uh, writes or rings to your customers and try to trick them to step over from one organization to another organization. The strategic plans is exactly the same. What are your plans for the upcoming year, two years, three years? Did you find a niche in the market and are, are you going to exploit this, this niche? Um, very useful for competitors. And the final one is uh, the business uh, reputation, like I said, the goodwill. And if you uh, have a, a positive goodwill, then banks will be uh, more friendly uh, when you ask for a loan. And um, if you have a, a, a positive goodwill, then your suppliers or vendors will be easier to uh, deal with you. But you also need trust, confidence from the public. If your customers or your patients or your uh, passengers are not happy with you because some piece got into the media and it was bad news that is negative for your trust or confidence, then, um, well, people can uh, leave you and go to the competitor. So what you do is first list all the assets, then subdivide it into the four appropriate classes, and if you make a spreadsheet out of it, then it could look like this. Here you see the four classes, and here you see all these bullets, and you see next there is a column called description. You have to describe what is this specific asset and it would be very convenient if you can list the right column, the owner. 
who in the organization has been announced to be the owner of this piece of asset. <coughs> and if you don't know the owner, then at least the C-level is the owner, top management. So this is your asset list. The next step, before we go into uh, a break, is a criticality identification. So we have our assets categorized in four classes. Now we are going to look into the asset list and find the major assets. How can you find the major assets? Well, by um, making your asset list, your you skip the paper clips and, and, and the paper. You try to find only the major assets, otherwise it would be pages long. So, your asset list, and especially uh, the one I, I, I showed you, so this one, should only contain the major asset, asset, assets. We are going to um, pinpoint the criticality. How critical is a major asset for um, achieving the mission of the organization. What we need at the end, after this step, is uh, what we call the asset criticalities matrix. Per major asset, you can see how critical it is in relationship to uh, the mission of the organization. Okay, and then I have to uh, say something about criticality. Every asset, even a paper clip or a piece of paper, has a basic criticality. Otherwise you didn't uh, bought it. You needed it somewhere, some, uh, some place in a business process. But some assets have, beyond the basic criticality, an intrinsic criticality. <coughs> that is typical a part of the asset itself. For example, if you buy a, 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 a computer, for example a notebook, um, then it has a basic criticality because you are not going to write uh, with uh, uh, paper and pencil, you are not going to use a typewriter, you are going to use a modern way of doing your word processing, that's a notebook, fine. And a notebook has some extras, namely an intrinsic uh, criticality, because you are using a notebook instead of uh, a paper and pencil, you have to be aware that you always um, have electricity or a, a full battery, otherwise it won't work. You have to be uh, uh, aware that um, you have enough memory, otherwise you can't store the documents that you are producing. That's the least thing that uh, comes with having a notebook. You have uh, the need of a specific kind of software to do the word processing you want to do. Well, if you lose your notebook, then you talk about the, the derivative criticality. If you lose a notebook, then if you don't took uh, precautions, all your documents are gone. So you have to be aware that when you use a notebook instead of a, a paper and pencil, that you have to copy all your documents once in a while, a more while than once, onto an extra uh, piece of uh, memory to store, to have an extra storage facility for all the documents, that if the notebook get lo gets lost, not everything is lo lost. If you lose a pencil or a piece of paper, then it's easily replaced, but the things you have written down, you, 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 you can't uh, uh, lose that in an easy way, because you wrote it and it's then going to be used. You don't know what the person who got your handwritten document does with it, but that's another question. So, to decide 
the criticality per major asset, you have to look into two things and you can combine them. We use a five point scale, starting with one, that's the lowest scale, it's not critical, but helpful. And when you look at the costs, then it's it's easy replaceable. It doesn't cost a lot of money that if it's gone to replace this asset. From one, not critical but helpful to operations. The next level is three, somewhat critical, but operations can go on with serious impacts, but it's not down. The cost to replace it, um, well, the money you have to use for that can't be used for other things you want to do in your organization. Five is critical. Okay, you can operate, but not a 100%. You have diminished capacity. The asset is replaceable, uh, replaceable, but it costs you either a great deal of money or it will weaken your production level even more. Then comes the heavy part. If you have a very critical asset, you give it an eight. And then you know if you lose these assets, you can only go on with your production maximum several days and then it's over. Then you have to re have replaced this asset. It costs you a great deal of mo money and if you don't do it you lose your production. And the 10 is the absolute, absolute critical uh, asset to your daily operations. When it's gone, operations is gone. And you of course, you can buy a, a new piece of asset, but it's so expensive that you can't afford it. And maybe you have a, a waiting time before you get, can get a, an extra uh, asset. So every asset on your spreadsheet, categorized in the four classes, you now have to give it an estimation, putting a number, one, three, five, eight, or ten. It looks like this. Here you have your assets. There is the criticality column. You simply put, for example, senior executives. Well, can you uh, do your production without them? Most of the time, yes. So, maybe uh, they are uh, five critical. It depends on the organization, uh, but you can't say they're very critical or absolutely critical. Um, for example, if you look at property, oh no, I take another example. If you look at customers, well, no customers, nothing to sell, nothing to sell, no incoming money. So you don't uh, uh, can without do without your customers. So customers. Well, it could be uh, an eight, very critical. Um, vendors. If you need material to produce what you have to produce and your vendor won't deliver, you have a problem. It depends on the type of organization and the business processes, how critical it is. Um, so you, you, you can look through, through all these uh, uh, standard uh, uh, asset list and you put one, only one number per asset line. So you have the 10, the 8, the 5 and the 1 to choose out, to choose from and you put it in your criticality column. If you have filled it in don't forget to save it under the name Asset Criticalities Matrix. Then we have now two things. We have our assets grouped per class and per major asset 
the criticality. We pick up this list, this asset criticalities matrix, when we are doing the risk analysis part. Then we are going to combine threat agents, threats, vulnerabilities <coughs> with criticalities. <coughs> so, where do we stand now? We did risk identification, the first part, the assets, understand and describe the organization's assets. We did the asset characterizations, we have two results, the asset list and the asset criticalities matrix. Like I said, normally you would do the consequences uh, characterization and the vulnerability characterization, but that's quite uh, uh, difficult to understand, it's easier to understand when we first did uh, do the threat agents and the threats. So I'll put it aside and that will be part of lecture four. And we are now going to switch from the assets to the threat agents, but first we are going to have a break. And um, 15 minutes, okay? Yes, 10 past 3, we'll continue. Time to continue. I want to uh, pinpoint that the way I teach you to uh, do a risk assessment is a general way. So what you are going to understand and apply during uh, this course you can use it for all kinds of risk assessments. For example, if you have to do a risk assessment for, your, for an IT department, then your organization is the IT department. If you have to do a risk assessment, for example, on your IT network infrastructure, then your organization is the IT network infrastructure. I'll take you through the broad approach, but everything that you hear, see and are going to do by yourself, you can use it in whatever kind of risk assessment you need to do in future. We just looked into uh, the assets, we did the asset characterization resulting in an asset list and the asset criticalities matrix. We have to do two more steps the consequences on the assets when something bad happens and the vulnerabilities that are um, in the assets. We'll take that part, like I said, in lecture four. Now we're going into the threat agent part. A threat agent or threat actor is always a group or an individual. So we're talking about persons. When we go and look into the threats, then we talk about threats from uh, threat agents as a source, but it can also be from a natural cause. Then we talk about criminal events and hazards. Threat agents is only human oriented. These are the bad guys, or the bad people. What do we need to do to get a picture of our threat actors? The same thing, we try to uh, characterize the threat actors that are possible. After we have done that, per threat, threat actor, we are going to look into the adversary, the means, what they do threat actors use when they are planning an attack. And finally we do an, a target attack valuation, uh, attack value identification. That's what 
target, what asset, is the most obvious one that the threat agent will choose to perform an illegal action. But first the threat actor characterization. Same way, like the assets. We start with a list with all the possible threat actors. Well, after that you have to categorize it in four classes and after that you have your, your threat actor list. We're going to look into four different classes. We are going to look into the violent criminals, an individual or a group that uses violence to get what they want. We're going to look into the cat category of petty criminals, what we call in Dutch kleinschalige criminaliteit, this is the, 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 the small acts of uh, uh, people, um, for example, uh, burglary uh, is, is one example of uh, what petty criminals do. Economic criminals, these are criminals that want to get gain in terms of value, money. And then we have a broad group that we call activists. <coughs> are the four classes and you see pictures at the right hand uh, side of the slide. It's the same way. Class one, the violent criminals. They use violence, that's why you see a picture of a bomb on the left upper corner of the circle. What can you find among violent criminals? Well, the street criminals, also known as gangs. Angry visitors, if they don't uh, agree with your organization or, or, or with your products uh, and they are uh, allowed to enter your organization, they make AMOC and they get angry and they mostly use uh, violence. For example, if you are a, 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 an office of the uh, Gemeente, uh, municipality, uh, then um, you want to apply for uh, a loan or whatever, and if you get a no, and a no, and a no again, then you often see that a person who wants to apply for a loan or uh, other kind of money grabs the person uh, who's, who made the decision or communicated the decision, or even worse, gets out of the building, steps in his car, and the car is uh, driven into the building. Then you have the category uh, sexual criminals, the uh, mugging parking lot violence, just uh, hit and run, civil disorder, and deranged persons. Yes, the deranged persons, they are a bit, uh, it can happen. Um, but they are most of the time uh, persons that are so deranged that they always use violence to get what they want. The other category, uh, class two, the petty criminals, well, the vandals, they like to destroy a lot of things. Uh, the usual category of pickpockets on the metro, in the train, uh, wherever, or in uh, shops. Then you have the category prostitutes, pimps and panderers and the disturbance causes. They are not violent, but they can uh, become very angry. They shout and they uh, make a lot of noise. Class three, the economic criminals. They want money, virtual or real. And you can see subgroups like transnational criminal organizations. Um, for example, uh, what you see is a lot of um, uh, car thefts, um, trucks. They want the, uh, the material that is in the truck. Sometimes they have it, uh, it uh, organized from border to border and they simply phone or whatever to the party that is in the Netherlands or in, um, for example, Croatia and then they know that there is a, a truck with uh, valuable stuff and these transnational criminal organizations send people, criminals, to that truck. They steal 
either the whole truck or the valuable goods that are in the truck. Organized crime. Yes, that can be uh, quite uh, a lot. Uh, you have uh, uh, organized uh, crime, uh, especially when you talk about um, stealing virtual money. Then you have uh, criminal organizations that, for example, uh, target from out of Russia and uh, um, are able to intercept uh, 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 bank codes and rob your bank account. account. What you also have is uh, the organized crime like uh, the Mafia in different kinds, uh, not only the, the Italian, but you have uh, the, the Turkish, uh, all kinds of groups that, uh, that have uh, organized themselves on a specific type of goods that are very valuable and if they steal it and they can sell it, they earn a lot of money. Then you have the sophisticated economic criminals. Well, these are groups, or most of the times groups, that set up a specific scheme and um, they want to, <coughs> for example, they, they try to uh, launder money. They transfer uh, money from one bank to another bank to another bank to another bank so that you can't trace where all the money went. And finally, they can uh, take the money out of the bank and bring it out in, into the open, and then the money is laundered. Uh, you have unsophisticated uh, economic criminals. They don't think about the scheme, they just do what is the most convenient way at that moment. And the last class, uh, the activists, well, that's a, a, a mixture of all kinds of uh, individuals and groups. They have, um, for example, a specific cause they believe in. And because of what they believe, they want to uh, do harm to organizations. Um, you have also the political and the economic uh, and the industrial spies. They want your proprietary information, uh, your uh, secret uh, formulas, your patents, uh, uh, your plans, whatever. Then you have the uh, saboteurs, that's uh, not a petty crime, uh, that simply wants, wants to, uh, well, get rid of their anger. But these people, these saboteurs, are willingly taking, taking a, a, a specific organization and want to stop the production process, or whatever they want. Then you have the cults, the dedicated activist groups. Well, some people say uh, 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 <coughs> that <coughs> uh, parties like uh, the motor clubs, uh, the Hells Angels and, and that kind of uh, groups belong to uh, cults dedicated uh, activist, uh, activist groups. Then you have, of course, the hackers, sometimes individuals, sometimes groups. You find them uh, from all over the world. Then you have the, uh, the threat actors that invade your privacy. Well, there are different ways how to invade somebody's uh, privacy. So we'll come to that later when we talk about uh, <coughs> consequences and countermeasures. And we have the persistent uh, rule violators. These are people that um, don't like rules and everything they can do to break a rule, they will do. But it's simply to, uh, to harass, not to destroy. If you talk about terrorists, well, terrorists you can uh, put into the cause-oriented subversives or you can uh, put them into the cults or dedicated activist uh, groups and sometimes specific terrorists could be among the hackers. I explicitly don't uh, uh, put uh, terrorists in an extra class because they get too much attention and often you can uh, put uh, terrorists under the class for activists. Okay, so you list all this 
groups categorized in four classes and then you have your thread actor list so make a spreadsheet the second thing you have to do after you know ah these are the four classes uh, of uh, thread actors you have to look per thread actor what means does this thread actor have to reach whatever this criminal wants violent economic gain uh, pity uh, things or uh, specific uh, subversive acts okay what do we n uh, need we need to look into what is the motivation or what are the motivations which capabilities have a has a threat uh, actor and is there some kind of history known about what the targets are or the, the, the ways these uh, threat actors operate most of the time there is too little information inside the organization where you have to do your risk assessment so you have to look in the outside world for example uh, looking uh, for sources on the internet where you can find some extra information about specific threat actors. What we need is to know something about professionalism, access to weapons, the entry methods they use, the threat scenarios they used, and finally we have to do an estimation on a five scale. The result must be an adversary means matrix. How are we going to do that? Okay, first professionalism. Um, that's their trademark. How capable are they? If you see uh, a criminal as a professional, then you can pinpoint on specific details what makes him a professional these factors you have to look into what's his motivation what are his capabilities history training levels surveillance capabilities planning skills and what's the organization and support well the more organized a threat agent is the more you will see that there is organization and support planning skills uh, maybe a training level Next, if we know the professionalism of a threat actor, we have to find out what kind of weapons A, a he has access to and B, B, he will probably use. Okay, these are the kinds of weapons that you can look into. The bladed ones, the guns, hand grenades, mortar, shoulder valve, bombs, cars, aircraft, chemical and biological agents, cyber strike, other. Then the entry methods. If a threat actor can't get into your organization, then there is no risk. So there must be a possibility to access, so there must be an entry method. And it depends on the entry method a threat actor uses uh, that's more or less successful. False credentials can be used, social engineering, entry by threat, forced entry, think about the car running into the building, breaking and entering, an insider job, and hacking. And finally, the threat scenarios used, well, depending on the class of threat actor, there are certain criminal acts that most of the time belong to this class of threat actor. For example, violent crime acts. Most of the time you see either violence against employees, violence against the public on the organization's property, visitors, customers, or whatever, offenders. Um, they um, Usually, by violent crime, uh, crime acts, bladed weapons are used, or handguns, uh, and even bombs. If you look at the pity uh, crime acts, 
You see, because the, the pickpockets were in the petty crime uh, class, you see a lot of purse snatching, of course, the actual pickpocketing. Petty crimes come with uh, vandalism, destroying things. And sometimes, well, uh, uh, it's a, a petty crime, it's a small crime, if you do something in the category of prostitution, pimping, and it's, well, it's there. By economic crimes, or economic crime acts, you see robberies, you see burglary, you see the insider theft. Maybe you saw uh, or, or, or heard about um, that there were, were a lot of uh, thefts on uh, Schiphol Airport uh, out of the luggage. Well, Schiphol used to uh, hire uh, agents to check the luggage and not every agent uh, well, can be uh, trusted uh, fully and there were a lot of um, thefts and complaints about uh, luggage being uh, sought through. And that's a, a typical an example of an insider theft. You don't expect an agent, a security agent, that does the uh, actual uh, luggage screening to steal out of the luggage. Well, it happens. Uh, Propriety information theft, yes, that's also uh, a quite uh, nice economic, uh, economical crime act because uh, uh, you can sell it to the competitor. E for example, if you need uh, money, then uh, you can uh, steal secret plans and sell it to the highest bidder. Crimes against organizations, business reputation. Yes, um, think about. Um, we we we, we didn't, didn't have it uh, the la in in the last decades, but um, in the past there were a lot of actions uh, against uh, Shell uh, when they uh, were uh, working in South Africa, when there was the apartheid uh, uh, regime, and um, a lot of activists then tried to um, well hinder the public and they wanted the public not to take in oil or gas at Shell. Um, there were uh, some uh, crimes against uh, the business reputation of an organization. Um, in, 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 um, you had the, uh, the incidents at the Marco uh, the retail organization where activists set fire to uh, the buildings of the macro. So we have in the Netherlands a couple of uh, crimes against the organization's business reputation. Not to simply uh, uh, destroy something, but to um, make the goodwill and the trust and the confidence in a, a specific organization less. And of course you have uh, the Economic Crime Act in as computer crimes. And that's uh, quite a lot. Computer crimes, are, I, 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 everything you can think about with a computer, either as a target or as a means or uh, whatever can be done to get economic gain. And then we have the activists, they often do subversive acts like uh, uh, civil disorder or riots especially when you have uh, the football game, game between uh, Ajax and Feyenoord, then you can count on it that there will be riots depending on where uh, the game is take, taken place, uh, either in Amsterdam or in uh, Rotterdam or in the trains and the buses uh, between the two cities. Uh, protests, yes, that's uh, 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 a right we have in uh, uh, in the Netherlands, if you do not agree with something, then you can march for another solution and then you can uh, do protests. For example, uh, the, the, the protest from students 
who didn't like the idea of the new ways of financing the uh, study programs that, uh, well, it didn't help. Um, you can uh, perform intimidation. Well, if you don't do what I want you to do, then I'll know where you live. I know where to find you. And then there is uh, the drugs in the workplace. Well, s s s s s sometimes um, it's sold at the workplace, it's dealt at the workplace, or it is even used in the workplace. And then you have uh, sabotage. Well, it's very nice uh, to uh, do a DDoS. And don't forget about corporate spying. Because we have a lot of, uh, um, well, hired workers with uh, a, a, a greater deal of flex force, you don't know exactly what you have in the house. And sometimes somebody is put somewhere in a specific organization to look for um, material that is not for this person but is for the organization we now have, maybe you became aware of it, um, the situation that a uh, software co Dutch software company um, is been uh, well is going to be looked into for fraud because they uh, set people away. And in the organization where they uh, were put to work, they found out about strategic plans and they gave it through their own organization. And so this IT company could win new contracts. Okay. What you do is you have your threat agent agents list, you set in the spreadsheet all the categories of the adversary means and you are going to score it the same way, one not likely, three somewhat likely, five likely, <coughs> eight very likely and ten absolutely likely. And it looks like this, well it's, it's hard to see but Everything you see on the top, if you look in the spreadsheet I made, it's nicely put over there. But if you do a copy and paste, it's this. So, here you have your four categories, your four classes of threat actors. This, these are the items for professionalism, access to weapons, entry methods and threat scenarios used and you simply look into each cell and you put a value in it. Either a 1 or a 3 or a 5 or a 10. So you have to score and the difficulty is you, if you don't have any experience with these kinds of threat agents as an organization or with these kinds of uh, um, categories then you have to find data outside of the information and you can use it's an estimation based on whatever you find outside the organization through the internet and if you use uh, uh, your brains then you can simply um, put a number in into a cell but you have to motivate why you think if you put an 8 or a 10 why you think it should be an 8 or a 10 okay then you have to do the next step after you have done the uh, target uh, of the the threat agents list uh, you scored um, the adversary means now you have to look into the target attack value. What is the most interesting part 
for a threat agent. Well, then you have to know something about targeteering. You have a target, the asset or the organization you want to attack, but there is more, you have to know something about the MOM. And the result is what we call a target attack value matrix. Okay, MOM, the motive. What is the motive a threat agent has to do what he thinks he has to do? Motive says, does the threat actor have a reason for selecting the target? If you want to rob a bank, then you're going to look for a bank. You're not going to rob an oil station. If you are a pickpocketer, then you look for a nice crowd where you can walk through and then it's not of use for you if you have a single person walking in the street. So, a threat agent will always try to find a target that is the most convenient for him or her and that will bring him the most value, whatever value he seeks. That can be uh, violence, that can be economic value, that can be uh, uh, well, something pity uh, like uh, 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 breaking uh, things or defending uh, some kind of cause. Opportunity. Does the threat actor have the opportunity, opportunity to affect a strike against its enemies that is both meaningful and effective? <coughs> okay. If you have a target, for example, a bank. Do you have as a threat actor the opportunity to really rob the bank? Well, then you have to know what are the opening times of a bank. You have to know something about the security of a bank. You have to know where is the money kept inside the bank. Uh, are there specific days in the week or specific days in the month where there is more money in the bank vault than all the days. So you have to create as a bank robber uh, the nicest opportunity to actually go and rob the bank. The means does, does the threat actor have the materials, manpower, secrecy and support to carry out the mission? Okay, we're trying to do uh, the bank job. I don't know if you have seen the movie, great movie. Um, this group of threat actors uh, hire uh, a shop next to the bank. They dig underneath the wall and come out into the bank fold. Well, they need the material to dig, they need the manpower to do all the digging, uh, they need the secrecy, uh, it was a shop for hire, so all the windows were uh, uh, blackened. Uh, they have to uh, have support, somebody on the outlook, is police coming, is whatever, so you need a lot of planning and organization if you want to do a proper uh, bank robbery. So the MOM, the motive, the opportunity and the means, you have to calculate and then you become the target attack value. Okay, same way, one not likely, until ten absolutely likely. put your threat actors into the four classes, you put on the right hand side your uh, target and there you see MOM, motive, opportunity and means. If you're smart, of course you're smart, you take this spreadsheet that you have created, or better, you have created this one, you save it as a document under the name Threat Actor List, 
then you add in this spreadsheet the columns professionalism until uh, uh, target uh, excuse me threat scenario uh, used with the scoring you save it as your adversary means matrix and then you add on the right hand side of the last spreadsheet an extra uh, three columns meaning target and you save this under the name of target attack value so what do, do we have now? we have three results from our threat actor we have a threat actor list copied and filled with adversary means saved as adversary means matrix copied put on the target attack columns save it under the target attack value matrix we had already our asset list and our asset criticalities matrix so now we have five documents and you can reduce it if you see that your threat actor list is part of as well the adversary means matrix as your target value uh, matrix you can make it one great matrix then you have one single document with all the threat actor information in it okay before i go to the threats the final part of uh, the identification for today we have uh, to manage two more from uh, the assets uh, any questions anybody lost not yet okay the threats we do two things we do a characterization of the criminal events and we do a characterization of the hazards that's quite simple it's easier said than done because criminal event characterization find any and all kinds of information on what criminal events have occurred within the last five years so you're looking for historical information well we have a problem now because we have silver star uh, uh, mine uh, as a case uh, and that happens often that your organization you have to do an assessment for doesn't have uh, criminal uh, information kept what you can do is look for similar organizations or um, uh, companies that are in the same area where your organization lives or you can look into the um, publicly, publicly available uh, statistics to see what has happening in the last five years so what you are going to look for is in the four uh, categories uh, um, what uh, violent crimes have been uh, have taken place in the last five years uh, uh, felonies assaults rapes murders economic crimes burglaries break-ins equipment thefts robberies information thefts vehicle crimes two types thefts of vehicle and the other one is theft from vehicle well you, you know the difference um, eastern european uh, uh, criminal groups often um, steal cars because they have an order uh, for um, can you deliver to me uh, five uh, VW Golf uh, can you deliver me uh, 10 BMW, BMWs uh, whatever and then they simply uh, find those cars in the Netherlands and steal the car and you can find if you have a trace on the car you can find them back somewhere in Poland or Russia or wherever sometimes you don't even find your car but then the, the parts of the car 
unwanted. Uh, they, uh, the criminals get uh, 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 an order from, uh, we need uh, so and so many airbags. Well, then the airbags are stolen out of the vehicles. So that is a theft from a vehicle. Or if you have uh, a tom-tom and you left it on uh, your dashboard uh, and you uh, went out your car, you closed it, then you could be surprised that when you come back and see your car, then your uh, rear window is smashed and your tom-tom isn't there anymore. Or your laptop or whatever nice stuff. So that's uh, the difference between theft of a vehicle and theft from a vehicle. Uh, now yeah, the, 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 the pity crimes, uh, purse snatching, desk pilfering, pickpocketing, vandalism, oh, the subversive, you, you can read it, it's, it's almost the same like we said about uh, the track agents and what you have to do is simply take these categories and it's now 2015, so 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And if you know that one of these criminal events happened in your organization and you know the year, then you can make an entry in this uh, list. And sometimes you don't have any historical information. Then you have to do without it. The same way you deal with hazards. Look back into the last five years and do we have, a, does the organization have some safety hazards, security hazards, natural disasters, or possibly political or military hazards? Well, safety hazards has, have, do always have to uh, do with, deal with people. Um, safety is the well-being of the people in an organization. In this category of safety hazards, you see fires. There can also be a fire due to negligence. That's a human error. Then you have other uh, kinds uh, of human error, but they don't result in a fire. You have your safety violations, poor design of equipment or your building, faulty or poorly maintenance. That's uh, very uh, common. An institutional failure, it's a standard that the organization, the type of organization, will have this kind of failure, because that's common. And it can be that you have a high societal uh, tolerance to safety hazards. Safety is not so much an issue, just like security isn't. Well, the security hazards uh, come from uh, two types, uh, either the persistent rule violators, don't smoke a cigarette next to the uh, electrical power station. Where else can I smoke? The environmental uh, factors. Maybe you can use something that you had found um, at A1, the external context. Where is the organization located? Your natural disaster hazards. Well, that's all kind of shit where that is not a, a human cost, sometimes it's called, uh, it's done, acts of God. Well, I don't want to use that uh, uh, name, but sometimes you see it <coughs> in the literature, then they refer to the acts of God, that's natural disaster hazards. Like earthquakes, well, we don't have earthquakes in the Netherlands, it's the first reaction, well, then I say, think about Groningen. Hurricanes, tropical storms, well, they're not very common in uh, these regions. Tornadoes, hailstorms, thunderstorms and lightning, snow and ice, floods, landslides and mudslides, fires from natural causes, fog, hail, heat, wind. Well, how much shit can you bear? And then you have uh, something that can come out of... Uh, um, a situation, uh, you, you, well, it, it, it sometimes happens, uh, a political hazard or a military hazard, uh, look at uh, Ukraine. Well, 
it's not common in uh, the Netherlands, but you have to look into it. So you can do the same thing. You have these four classes of hazards, and you have 2010 until uh, 2014. And if you know that your organization, you have to, ex to assess, has faced one or more of these hazards, make an entry. And you will see that uh, uh, quite a lot of these hazards uh, will not happen in the Netherlands. Hmm? Hurricanes and tropical storms will... These... Mwah. And you do it the same way. One. If it's useful and you can't find historical information, then you could always do the trick by making an estimation based on the likeliness. So what do we have? When we build the picture of the threats, we have a criminal events list and we have a hazard list. We have a lot of lists for so far. You know now, after we did last time process A, establish the context, we now did B1, the identification. We looked into the assets, we looked into the threat agents, we looked into uh, the threats. We have two more components of the assets to look into for next time. But you now have a, 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 an idea of what you have to produce. So, to sum up, you know now when to apply the risk model, something about the assets. We do not know how those assets actually are threatened. We know something about the threat agents and we know possibly something about the history of criminal events and hazardous uh, events, but we don't know exactly the connection between assets, threat agents and threats. That's because we didn't do the risk analysis process Yes, yet. So two, how are those assets threatened? And three, what can owners do, do to counter those threats? We'll come into that in the upcoming lectures. Perform a risk assessment. You know now something about identifying assets and vulnerabilities. And you know something how to identify your threat agents and your threats. The vulnerability part is still open. What I want you to do as practical assignment is take the same case study, our Silver Star Mines. It's the same document you already uh, have used for uh, A, establishing the context. What you are now, now going to do is perform the risk identification and you are going to read the case again, think about the colouring, assets a specific colour, threat agents a specific colour, Read the case, think about data at a similar company, select the appropriate data for the, doing the characterization of the assets, the threat agents and the threats. And what I want you to deliver is at least three separate Excel documents one for the assets, one for the threat agents, and one for the threats. When we look into the homework, study 14.3.14.4, read for next time 1.1 one one and 1.2, one and the assignment number 3, because there is something new now, 
the results of your assignment tree, so your Excel uh, documents, you're not going to upload from today on into the Dropbox, but in the assignments folder on uh, the VLO, uh, I have created per class new folders. You find, for example, IFSEC 1 RA risk assessment assignment tree. The pairs out of class IFSEC 1 can upload their results from assignment tree in that folder. There is uh, the same folder but then for IFSEC 2. So per class you have your own risk assessment assignment tree folder. You also see that I've put down already the same type of folders for risk assessment 4 and risk assessment uh, 5 and the final uh, assignment. The final assignment is your research assignment. I want you to use the upcoming days to think about your research topic. It should be first pick out of the risk model one specific element. You have now more information about the asset element, about the threat agent element and about the uh, threat element. Maybe there is something that interests, interests you as a pair to take that as a research topic. If you have ideas about your research topic, then you can, can um, uh, um, show it to me on Thursday, or if you want to, you can email me. I don't want you already to decide definitively on your research topic. So you can postpone, but I will uh, tell you when you have to stop postponing. The deadline, <coughs> guys, the deadline for uh, uh, the delivery of your results of assignment 3 is not upcoming Monday, but Monday the 2nd of March, 10 o'clock. So you have a week of holiday next week, so you can postpone, but you can no longer postpone then till uh, Monday morning, very early on the 2nd of March. <coughs> so your, your uh, next week will be, be a holiday week. Enjoy it. And I see you uh, on Thursday. Volgende week uh, helemaal plat. Uh, ja, nee, dan moet je inderdaad even aan wennen. Dus dat betekent de hele maandag tot en met vrijdag. Uh, okay. Geen lessen. Uh, ook, nee. ook geen contact. Zijn jullie er wel? Nee, 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 nee. nee, nee. nee. Dat proberen wij ook. Uh, uh, geldt gelijk. Oké, okay, bedankt. Tenzij het heel urgent is. Uh. Nee, nee, nee.